Shout out to Chargers Unleashed, Sebastian Joseph Day, you know the vibes, we outside. You're listening to the Chargers Unleashed Podcast with your host, Dan Wolkenstein and Jake Hefner. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein from the LA Football Network. Today's show, of course, being brought to you by Bet Online, Charger Bowl Family, Rock Solid Sports Memorabilia, and Liquid Death. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button if you're a first time watcher of the show. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. <sighs> you know, Dan Wolkenstein, most people would say after three weeks of NFL football in the books, depending on where your team is at, some teams are sitting in an undefeated record right now. They're on a very good high charging toward the NFL playoffs and possibly a Super Bowl contention for their respectable teams. Other teams just getting their first win this weekend and makes them feel good. They're kind of getting back on track. Other fan bases are saying R E L A X relax. I've said that if you're the charger fans following yesterday's loss to the Jacksonville Jaguars, um, I guess you could say everything from throwing into the towel to seasons over to hello 2023. I mean, oh my god, here we go. <laughs> because it's not just the standpoint that the Chargers lost the game. It's that the losses that took place beyond the loss could be greater losses than the game itself. If that made any sense. Wow. That's <laughs> very philosophic. I like that. Thank you. Uh, I just used philosophic for the first time. Philosophical is what I meant to say. Um, Jake, you are missing one group in there. The winless fan bases. You got the 0-2-1 Texans. You got the Raiders who have yet to win a game. And I'm sure they're all searching for imdb.com, looking up Owen Wilson movie titles to get them through the week because they're now 0-3. Uh -huh. At least the Chargers have a win. <laughs> we'll take it. Um, okay, but seriously, look, the Chargers game sucked. They got their asses kicked. It was embarrassed. Drew Twinkle talked about it. A lot of folks were in their feelings, fan base included. But the amount of insane takes and sky is falling, gaslighting, get ready for 2023. Let's go first round draft pick. I want the number one pick overall. Sit Herbert for the rest of the season. Fire Staley into less. Like, guys. And maybe I'm talking to you, Jake. I don't know. We're gonna get in it. You're really talking talk to somebody. <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of people love listening to your positive outlook, and I hope that they're tuning into the show for that right now because <sighs> I was like, I was thinking to myself today, I'm like, how in the world is Dan going to try to spin his positivity note on this one? <laughs> and right off the bat, didn't waste any time. Look, here it comes. In, in my eyes, Jake, we'll get into it. There's a gradient scale, right? One to 10, if you will, of like panic to euphoria. And this fan base is like far crazy all the way past panic and like into just like, I give up. Um, and feeling seemingly like I did last week where it was nothing but liquid death for me in this household and i feel better now physically emotionally non-charges related i feel better but um our good friends over at liquid death uh, are trying to keep folks hydrated are trying to keep folks sustainable getting rid of all of the aluminum cans and are trying to murder <laughs> thirst yes <laughs> for all of humanity jake uh, tell our good friends about our friends over at Liquid Death. Well, if you're at your local Albertson 7 Eleven route, I thought you were going to say if you're at your low point. <laughs> <laughs> if you're at your low point and you need a good refreshment, a good pick me up, go out and find yourself what looks like a tall boy, but they're not because they're actually just sitting right in the middle of the water section. But go find yourself our good friends over at Liquid Death. They are one of the newest sparkling water companies that are out there uh, come in actually three flavors that they have, Dan. There's lime, there's mango, and there's regular sparkling water that they have. I actually just had some last Saturday. Probably could have used some today. It, it honestly 
probably couldn't cure my negativity for how I feel right now, but it was Never. a good try. It probably would have been a good try. But as Dan mentioned, why is the water called liquid death? Well, because it, it brutally murders your thirst and they're, uh, <laughs> it's a great tagline. Uh, and they're infinitely recyclable tall boy cans are helping to bring death to plastic bottles. And they, and they actually donate 10% of their uh, profits from every can sold to help them kill plastic pollution. So that's a great thing there, but go on, make sure you go on over to liquiddeath.com slash LAFB, tell them chargers on lease sent you and go get yourself some of this fine, fine, sparkling water, liquiddeath.com slash LAFB. They're like the night walkers of, of water. They're just killing everything. Starting I off, mean White Walkers. Did I say Night Walker? You said Night Walkers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's, that's it's going to be that going. kind of episode. It's going to be that kind of episode. All right, Jake. So Chargers get their butts kicked 38 to 10. We're going to into kind of a recap of the game, but I think there's kind of a micro and macro takeaways from this. Which ones would you like? So let's just because start. Because neither one of them are good. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay. So just to kind of kick it off. Uh, set the stage. Chargers lose 38 to 10, get the doors blown off of them for many reasons, which we'll get into. Uh, I think the bigger story, in my opinion, is the injury front. We saw Rashawn Slater go down. He saw Jalen Guyton go down. He saw Kenneth Murray go down. He saw Joey Bosa go down. The list goes on and on and on. Um, in short, just to kind of give it folks a recap, uh, Jalen Guyton, unfortunately, tore his ACL out for the season. Rashawn Slater tore a was it bicep muscle, I believe? <laughs> Tore his bicep. And he, Ruptured unfortunately, the, the, the all-pro second-year left tackle on the Chargers, arguably the top tackle in the AFC, is now, unfortunately, out for the season. Real crappy. No way around it. Uh, Joey Bosa has a, quote-unquote, significant groin injury, although is also week-to-week, -week, which that, I think... Honestly, is kind of, I mean, it's not great news, but it's better than not for the season. Like, it sounds like it's kind of like a month-ish kind of thing. Who knows? But it's not, like, out for the season. Um, but then otherwise, some positive updates for injury front. JC Jackson looks like he's good to go this week. Keenan Allen looks like he's good to go this week. Donald Parham looks like he's good to go this week. Justin Herbert did not aggravate anything. Uh, Kenneth Murray is fine. I think he's had the wind knocked out of him. Josh Palmer seems to be fine. So... I think I mentioned Donald Parham, but he's also going to be, should be seemingly planning on playing. So quick run out of the injuries. That's the bigger story to me, Jake. I know we're going to get into the, t the game and, and the overall kind of where to go from here, but losing Rashawn Slater, that's gut wrenching, man. Obviously for him as a person, it, it's terrible. And you, we hope speedy recovery. We've had him on the show. He's a great guy. Um, but for the team, like he was literally the anchor of this offensive line or arguably him or Lindsley Corey Lindsley also, by the way, uh, seems to be fine, but Rashawn Slater out for the season brutal. Um, I was feeling kind of gross about the game, but I think that's what hurt me the most because you know about your quarterback situation. He's the one that's protecting him. So make no mistake about it. You're not going to see any positivity from me there. Like, Jake, that not good. Okay. Are you good? Oh. Did you get it all out? I haven't even gotten the positive stuff yet, but oh boy. It's, which is amazing. <laughs> which is amazing considering your tone to open this show. My God. Um, yes, Dan is correct in the macro of everything. What really hurts more that actually losing the game to the Jaguars is the long-term injury suffered to Jalen Guyton, to Rashawn Slater. Joey Bosa is probably at minimum a four to six week injury that you're looking at. And you still have a list of guys right now that are going the right direction in terms of health, but it's still no guarantee. The they way the right direction, they're still not playing. <laughs> exactly. So who really knows at this point? So there's no guarantees, as I said at the opening of this show with the, with this Los Angeles Chargers team. There's no more guarantees. Um, Dan, my issue. Let's just talk one? about just one issue. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. This is this is just the beginning, my friend. Let's let's talk about the issues itself with the game. We knew what the situation was with Justin Herbert. 
moving forward, this was going to be an injury that was going to linger with him for a number of different weeks. You don't, we're, we're basically just up in the air because we don't know how it's going to affect him. Even if he is taking the pain killing shot, how is he going to look? And again, no Corey Lindsley, big problem for this offensive line when it comes to protection. The Jaguars basically took a page out of the Chiefs book once Corey Lindsley went down and once Trey Pipkins went out of the game in their week two matchup against Kansas City. And they put a lot of interior pressure on Justin Herbert. Matt Filer, once again, second in the offensive on the offensive line in this game and giving up pressures. And the pressures were high for an interior offensive lineman. Make no mistake about that. Where'd it's very go, You're hoping it gets better when Corey Lindsley eventually ends up returning to this team. It will. But the offense, Dan, the game plan, 10 days to get ready for this team. You don't even have to travel. For a majority of this game, for the Jaguars to hold the ball for nearly 40 minutes, your defense is gassed. Your offense can't get anything going. It comes out flat. Your run game is non-existent. You're leaving your quarterback out there after the game is seemingly lost to still get beat up on and still take hits. Let's not forget Jalen Guyton's injury literally came on what? The last like three plays of the game (laughs) before it happened. So what are you even doing with that type of an offensive game plan anyways when the game is already out of reach? Dan, Brandon Staley just got out coached in every single way by Doug Peterson. Doug Peterson had this team ready to play. And we talked about it last week. James Robinson, not Travis Etienne, but both, both of them put up a little, a a good run, a a good running performance. Specifically, James Robinson did the big one. Of course, was on a fourth and one play and rips it off for a 50 yard touchdown. How do you like that run game run defense? That was supposed to be better, but I understand that when you're tired and you're on the field for nearly 40 minutes, you're going to get gassed. So the offense wasn't doing anything to help the defense out in this game. Now, Dan, Justin Herbert did what he could. When they ended up finally putting one in the end zone, which made the game at that point in time 13-7, to you kind of thought to yourself, okay, that was a decent-looking drive. We may be back in a rhythm. No. No. I didn't understand this game plan that Brandon Staley and Joe Lombardi had. It literally, to me, was something that should have been a game plan for Chase Daniel. And if that was the case, then you should have just rested Justin Herbert. I didn't understand it. Of course, if we're talking about coverages, you don't know how many shots were really open down the field other than the ones that... that Justin Herbert threw that one insane ball downfield. But still, outside of that, Dan, Mike Williams, virtually non-existent in this game. Your run game, again, whether we're talking about Austin Eckler, Sony Michelle, Joshua Kelly. Joshua Kelly has been the best out of the three, which is unbelievable. Austin Eckler, who had 20 touchdowns last year. <clears throat> Brandon Staley in his press conference today had said that the goal is to get Austin more touches. Let me just check my watch here. It's week four (laughs) of the NFL, and that's the goal. Somebody want to check me on that? We're three weeks into the season, and Austin Eckler, I don't even think, has eclipsed 100 yards total rushing. The Chargers are last in the league in rushing offense. Who the hell would have expected to be sitting here at this point in the season? And that was a stat. Dan, lastly, and this will transition into the bigger picture. With the injuries that have already been suffered, with your quarterback that is going to be ailing probably at least for the next two months with his rib injury, looking at least like 50% of himself, now doesn't have his best blindside protector. Now there's going to be some reshuffling of the offensive line. Is Corey Lindsley going to come back? Are the Chargers going to go sign a free agent lineman? It's just another offensive line combination. And in truth, 
It's not sustainable to protect Justin Herbert. And it's not sustainable to get this run game going. I just don't see it because I don't see a game plan in place or any indication that there is change on the horizon. Now, I could be wrong this coming Sunday and things look completely different. But I'm going to tell you, Dan, I'm pretty doubtful that that's going to (laughs) happen. I have no indications to trust that the Chargers offensively with the game plan that they have put out, not just against the Jacksonville Jaguars, but for really entirely over the, let's just call it two and a half weeks of the first, you know, first three games here. Uh-huh. I'm very, very shaky as far as the confidence goes that they're going to be able to put something together that is going to not only be sustainable to their quarterback to keep him upright, but ultimately, is it going to win you games? And for those that say I'm too negative, by the way, I'm actually a pretty damn good friend. But (laughs) those of you that say I'm too negative, I'm sorry. I'm just looking at it as is. And I will eat crow all day long when it comes to me being wrong. I have no problem with that. I actually love being wrong on this show. Just let me know when it happens, and I'll be there to shake your hand. Okay. (laughs) That's a lot there, Jake. Um, (laughs) Folks listening, watching, Jake, yourself, do you feel any better after going through that? A little bit. Okay, good. Therapeutic is what we're here for. We're all five we're minutes, this. you know, two minutes from now. I'll we're, be right back in. I'll be right back at that seat. We're all in this together. All right. So let's just get into kind of the game itself. And, you know, I, I think one of the themes that I'm seeing post game is kind of like misguided, m- mistargeted frustrations and for like for example you know everyone's talking about you know the pissed off at joe lombardi because the offensive play calling and situational play call sure blah 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 blah. like honestly i don't necessarily like sure could he have but could he have better absolutely but like in my opinion i don't really think that was why the chargers lost the game like we talked about it last week, Jake. The in my eyes, the important part of this game one turnover ratio. Obviously, Chargers lost that. Zero and two, or negative two. Excuse me. Interception, fumble. Jacksonville recovered both. Duran James dropped an interception. You need to take advantage of this. He'll tell you should should caught it. Um, but more importantly, you, you and I have talked about this, and I don't necessarily know where this falls on, but the situational, not play calling, but the situational boneheaded plays that individual players made, in my eyes, costed this team far more than any play calling that the offensive or defensive coordinator did. Now, the Chargers ran a bunch of blisses on the defense. I think a lot of that was because Bosa was out. I think they blitzed way more than normally do, um, trying to mix things up. But on offense, Jake, I think that was the issue. Is the Chargers' offense wasn't able to move, and that wasn't because of play calling. Go back and watch how many drives were crippled because of stupid penalties and obvious penalties. Like they were the right calls. Like let me just go down the list here, Jake. First quarter, okay, we had first and ten. Rashawn Slater, holding, 10-yard penalty, makes it then second and 15, they end up punting. Okay? Later on in the game, Chargers are driving. They're on about the 40, their own 40. Trey Pipkins, false start. Now all of a sudden, first and 15, that drive ends in a punt three plays later. Second half, I think this is the first drive of the second half was, was a touchdown, which is sweet, awesome. Later on, Third quarter, offensive holding goes from a second and four to a second and 14. Team ends up punting. You had false start. I believe it was on Trey Pipkins at one point. That's like five drives that you're starting off behind the sticks at 
first, second, whatever it is, and 15 or more. And I don't care who your quarterback is. Like, it's hard to go against a team and win when you are crippling yourself like that. And it it was fine. I was watching it with uh, my in-laws. And literally, my mother-in-law looks at me and she goes, it seems like all the calls are going against the Chargers. And I looked at her and I was like, yes, because that's what they're doing. Like, the, the Jaguars played a clean operation, Chargers didn't, and the Chargers got their butts kicked because of it. And unfortunately... Like, you know, it's a game of inches. Chargers had the defense, in my opinion, actually played pretty good until the fourth and one, and they gave up the 50-yard run of James Robinson, which I don't know what the team was doing, why they were all going left. But the defense did pretty darn good, all things considered, where the offense put them in. But the two fourth downs that the defense gave up turned into 14 points. So, like, let's call a spade a spade. Could could you be upset at Brand Staley because he left Justin Herbert in too long? Even though Justin Herbert was, like, imploring him, I know I want to stay out there with my teammates. Sure, you can get on him for that. Could you get on Joe Lombardi for not taking more deep shots out of the field? Arguably not, because he didn't have much time to get through it. I don't know. You're seeing flames everywhere, Jake. But, like, where, in your opinion, should they be directed towards? Where, watching this, listening to post-game reactions, listening to the press conference today, whatever, where is the blame? I mean, Dan, again, a lot of this is you're speaking all this stuff, and it sounds like undisciplined football given the penalties so that's a combination of two things it's one not being prepared enough and two boneheaded mistakes from the players that on the field and again i look just at the game plan dan now i know that the chargers fell down to an early hole in 13 points but austin eckler four carries for five yards and I'm not saying he's going to be the one saving grace because it really doesn't seem like he's going to be the one to save it because the rest of the Chargers running backs didn't do anything impressive either. But 12 carries collectively, 26 you, yards, not your the, the one play that was third and one where, where Eckler ran it up, then it was an end around to the right, and it ended up being no gain. Your offensive line, already with Corey Lindsley out, then you lose Rashawn Slater. Then Storm Norton comes over to the right side. Your offensive line is in shambles right now. And as much love as we'd like to give to Zion Johnson and how he looked through the first two weeks, not that he had a bad game, but these type of things are going to happen to a rookie when you have that much rotation with the center being gone and then you're moving your right tackle over. There's going to be mistakes that are made and there are going to be some you know, stunts that are blown from a from a uh, from a uh, blocking perspective, and you don't have the leader of your offensive line right there to call out protections. Dan, this offensive line is not sustainable as it stands today to let the running backs be the heavy carriers of the ball. Unfortunately, so now you have to go to Justin Herbert playing hero ball, even all it being at fifty percent. And the game plan for that just looked flat See, to me. It did. Like, I, 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 I pushed back. that For as terrible of a start as that team had, you said it. They were down 13 nothing. I think it was. They came back, scored a touchdown. You're feeling pretty darn good. Yep. And I, I think Staley alluded to it. Like that fourth and one that the defense gave up, touchdown, James Robinson, I think that was kind of... The, that was the initial backbreaker. And then in my opinion, the other drive that was the crippling one, I think it was the end of the third quarter where I want to say the Jacksonville Jaguars had like an eight or nine minute drive yep. that just took the game away. Mm -hmm. The rest of it became having to be hero ball and you can't run the ball. You just can't. There was a point where beginning of the fourth quarter 
when it seemed like, you know what, like, there's maybe they could come back. It seems kind of crazy, but is it worth it right now? Like, just like, no. and this is, and this is not like giving up. This is more just like, it is not worth it right now. Seeing how things are going. Correct. But like for the majority of that game until halfway through the third quarter, like the charges were right there. Given all of the craziness that happened. And then things just kind of got away from him. Like the score, 38 to 10, like it's it's bad. But like, I, I know I'm generally the optimist. People are going to be like, oh, he's just being positive again. Like, I'm sorry, but go back and watch and look at all the ridiculous ways that that game went sideways. And tell me that that was because of Brandon Staley or because of Joe Lombardi. Like, I don't think it was. Like, I'll call out when I see stupid play calls. Like, I hate, I don't know what we're doing with this with the tosses on third and short. I don't know what world we're living in that we think that we're at a point in the season where we need to start doing end around with DeAndre Carter <laughs> at the worst possible time when your offense that's, is just humming. And like, that's not the first time that they have thrown plays like that. They did it in the Kansas City game as well, which was completely unnecessary. I'm not I'm not saying that they're perfect, but like those plays aren't the main reason why they lost. I don't Dan, think I'm, so. I, I'm not saying it's the main reason why they lost. Just collectively as an offensive unit. You just looked unprepared to play. Like I said, Dan, this looked like it was a game plan for Chase Daniel in a preseason game. Okay, so and you, maybe the and and I'll tell talk you what. Talk about that. Talk maybe about the offline. Talk about yes, that. Maybe that was the case because if anybody saw the tweet case. pre-game show, uh, the pre-game uh, jumbotron, whatever you will, there at at SoFi was literally introducing Chase Daniel as the starting quarterback, almost kind of like a rehearsal for the game. They had his picture up on the screen. And when they said game time decision for Justin Herbert, that's what they literally meant because it literally came down to that when the news broke that he was ultimately going to start. So I don't know if Joe Lombardi just couldn't adapt. If he had this game plan set the entire time, I know from everything that we were told last week as far as what was taking place with Justin Herbert during practice was all structured. It was all part of the plan. We found out early Sunday that he... When he practiced last Thursday, he had to take a painkiller injection just to do that. We were told the next day on Friday that him not throwing was part of the plan the whole time. And then basically just wait and see how he feels come Sunday. So, Dan, if you just look at the polar opposites, just from the offensive side of the ball, Jaguars had a plan together. They had a plan. And when the Chargers had to, as you mentioned, blitz more because Joey Bosa being out of the game, so you had to bring a couple extra guys to fortify that with him being out, which they did. What was it like? I think it was just over 40% that they ended up blitzing him. He adapted just fine and was able to take advantage of that, hit the short passes, hit his running backs, and break off for big gains. And again, we're talking about drives here that are lasting six minutes plus, and we know what the final time of possession was. The defense was out there for 40 minutes. Your offense did nothing with 10 days of rest. If you you want to make an excuse that Ronaldo Hill had his, his defense prepared and they kept him in this game for as long as possible until they were just flat out gassed, that I will say to you that it didn't look like Vince Lombardi had his offense ready to play in this game. (sighs) And here's here's the one thing, Dan, because I know that this is a, a lot of criticism that's been coming out. Why was Justin Herbert left in the game? We heard Staley talk about it in his press conference at the end of the game, saying that was... His decision, basically just wanting that aspect of finishing as a team. Still not the best move in virtually anybody's opinion. Dan, check out this quote 
This is from, from Nick Cothrell from Sports Illustrated. This was his quote, I believe it was today, on his decision with 454 left, down 38 to 10, and leaving Justin Herbert in the game. Quote, in looking back at it, if I had to do it again, or if I had to do it again, I need to make sure that I communicate to Justin in a tough circumstance like that. When you're behind that you've and you've already when when you're behind that you've already done enough, I look forward to that next time. But in that moment, I don't regret how we went through that together. But I think the lesson moving forward is just making sure that he knows that he's already done enough. Now, hindsight could be 2020 all you want. But these are still growing pains that Brandon Staley is having to endure. And it's not clock management plays. It's nothing that we've gone through with other head coaches before that were ended up being really bad problems. But this was a big problem, Dan. I found this to be a very big issue. And as a head coach, whether you're Bill Belichick or Brandon Staley, you have to make the logical decision. And we're not talking about a quarterback who's healthy. We're not talking about a, a healthy quarterback between uh, behind a healthy offensive line that just so happens to be down 38 to 10 with 454 left. We're talking about a decimated offensive line that is attempting to protect your franchise quarterback that is already playing with torn rib cartilage. That was a move that, that Brandon Staley should have just taken control and pulled Justin Herbert from the game. Do you think that he should have played? It's it's an interesting thought process because when you look at the way that the game plan was executed, in my opinion, Chase Daniels should have won the game. But then as we were leading up to the game last week, obviously we always feel like we have a better chance to win the game. Even a 50 cent, a 50% Justin Herbert, we would hope would be able to rally the troops and secure a W for this team. But at that point in time, we hadn't seen what a 50% Justin Herbert looked like. And there were still throws that just made you just <laughs> drop your jaw that he was able to make under the circumstances. But then there was other ones, Dan, that were literally just to the sidelines. Simple 10-yard 10, uh, 10 throw, and you're dropping them at your receiver's feet. So I don't know what this is going to look like for him the duration of the season. But against a, a decimated offensive line now, Trust me, defense, opposing defenses smell blood in the water right now. And you just hope that this is not going to further injure your franchise quarterback. <laughs> A lot there. A lot there. <clears throat> um, I do think it's important that we engage in a discussion around possible solutions and like where to go from here. And I don't know if folks are ready for that not yet. I don't know if you're ready for that yet, Jake, but seemingly Corey Lindsley should be back. Sounds promising based off of comments on today. Rashawn Slater, not. So basically you're down your offensive tackle, your left tackle, and you now are left with Trey Pipkin, and Storm Gordon or insert variable. I I mentioned it earlier, Jake, uh, on social media for those who follow me. Um, there are ways to scheme around team weaknesses and strengths. <laughs> Whether or not a coaching staff or players can execute and develop that scheme, different story. In my opinion, the Chargers have the players right now. If the coaching staff were to implement a scheme that played to the overall offense's strength, not just Justin Herbert, because look, a lot of Justin Herbert's which strength... Is, I was just going to say, which is what? <laughs> At this point in time, what is it? Okay, so... I don't know all the answers, but I do think when a team has a, uh, what's a good way of putting it, uh, less than great 
pass blocking ability. It's a nice way to say it. Or unproven, whatever you want to call it. In my opinion, I've seen very many quarterbacks, good quarterbacks, say, you know what? Screw it. I'll take, I'm going to take it out of their hands. Three step drops all day. You see Mahomes do it. You saw Mahomes do it to us literally last week. You see Tom Brady do it all the time. Aaron Rodgers does it all the time. Derek Carr was doing it to us. And it was frustrating, but it was, I mean, not that it worked because they lost, but like that you see the quick, quick reads when your offensive line is going up against either better competition or they're not good. Chargers have personnel who is tailor made for short yardage, dink and dunk, efficiently moving down the field. At least passing wise. Obviously, they got the quarterback. They've got Keenan Allen, arguably the best route runner slot inside short yardage receiver in the NFL. One of the best. You've got DeAndre Carter, who, if you watch him, he's literally almost always open. You've got the guy in the practice squad that everyone freaking loves, Michael Bandy, who balled out training camp. Seemingly was always open. Shifty. Looks very similar to the Amendola, Wes Welker type. You got Mike Williams, if you want to throw it far. Or short, to be honest. We saw him kind of take that Michael Thomas route. DeAndre Carter can take that deep route, if you'd like. He's faster than most people. Josh Palmer is still that dude. And then there are guys in free agency, practice squads, that you can go out and get him to. You've got Donald Parham who you have yet to even have, have a chance to throw to yet, who is a mismatch everywhere. Jailed Everett, same. I haven't talked about the running game, which I think that is the part that has to get fixed. And I think that is the part that if you look at it, has to start first. The team, it, it's hard to stay balanced when you're fighting from behind. And I think that is how the team can solve it. Now, will Lombardi and Staley and everyone go that route? I don't know. But Jake, like I know we talk about like the rushing game needs to improve. But like let's say it doesn't. Who do you trust? <laughs> Justin Herbert and the receiving core to dink and dunk down the field. Or Austin Eckler, Sonny Michelle, Isaiah Spiller, Joshua Kelly. In this offensive line, who do you trust? Which one? Which one are you gonna go with? I mean, you're forced to have to put your trust in Justin Herbert because it's the best option that you have when you literally have nothing else working for you. Until I see the uh, the offensive line in this running game literally put this offense on its back and carry it to a win, I will then start siding with you, Dan, because it's not a bad plan. Is it a feasible plan? Sure. Under the circumstances, I don't have confidence in it, and I have less confidence that this coordinating staff is going to be able to adapt because they're very much of, you know, let's just keep doing what we're doing. Insert this guy, next guy up. We're still going to go out and we're still going to play our way type of mentality and play their game, regardless of whether or not your franchise quarterback is at less than a hundred percent, they're still going to do that. So you haven't seen the, the running game produce really anything for this Chargers team yet. Now with Rashawn Slater out now with the offensive line rotation, are you going to sign somebody this week? There's a Dar- there's Daryl Williams, there's a Mike Remmers out there. I know some people are clamming for Eric Fisher, not be my first choice per- personally, but are you going to make a move in that regard? I don't know, but even under those circumstances, even if you get Corey Lindsley back, I still shudder to believe that you're going to have the three running backs that have been running for you thus far be able to carry this team because See, I- we haven't seen it in three weeks thus far. And Dan, like I said... More importantly, more importantly than the overall execution, I still question the the play calling and the game plan 
more than I do the players going out there and carrying the game plan to fruition. I do think, Jake, um, and we'll probably get into this on the next episode too a little bit, but I do think that Corey Lindsley and Keenan Allen's absence is bigger than people care to believe. And especially in the running game, Corey Lindsley, and especially in short yard situations, Keenan Allen. And that's where the Chargers, like, they were not good the last two weeks, where those two specific things, they could not run the ball. Corey Lindsley, like, is one of the best, if not the best center in the NFL at many things. Controlling the interior line of scrimmage is one of those things. With him not there, look, Will Clapp has been serviceable. He hasn't been bad. If we're being honest, it's been okay. But, like, you go from elite to okay, you're going to see a dip. I don't know what's going on with Isaiah Spiller. I don't get it. I, I, is, there any, is there No. Is there, is there any explanation to what do you, as a matter of fact, what do you really have to lose at this point? I know I'm, it's just week three. It's not week 14. But really, at this point in time, given what your run game has produced, what's the problem? What really is it? Is, is it, it really can't get any worse if you make a decision to activate Isaiah Spiller now and have him start, get, start getting reps. To me, the Sony Michelle project that we were all excited for at the beginning of this season hasn't gotten the return that we would hope it, hope it would have. And Dan, again, just getting back to your point, if that is the game plan, like, I, I, and I get where you're coming from. That's an old school Tom Brady, New England Patriot game plan. Short yarded situations, run the football, sustain drives, put seven in the end zone, but then you have also have a defense that can play up to the standards that it needs to play at. And here's the kicker. Take the ball away. Something the Chargers have not done through the last two weeks. So no that tax. obviously needs to get even worse this past week. Yes. So there's a lot to throw in there rather than just simple X's and O's. It's obviously execution and personnel and ultimately conception to execution from the game plan from the coach and the coordinators. Yeah. And and obviously the Joey Bosa injury is big. Uh, we'll see how the team chooses to kind of push forward with that. If that means Kyle Van Noy goes to edge, if that means they go out and get someone, if that means the Chris Rump season, who knows uh, in the interim. But I mean, <laughs> and yeah, if it was, if it, if it, disappoints you just a little bit more if you're thinking like, okay, well, now we're down an edge rusher. Are we going to go out and sign a familiar name possibly? Well, Jamal Davis has returned to the Montreal Alouettes just last week. So he's, <laughs> I doubt you're going to uh, be able to sign him on on that time frame. No. Um, I don't know, man. But. The Chargers had, I think they had, they had no sacks. I want to say it was like what two, I think they had two pressures, two quarterback hits. I should say. I don't know about pressures. I haven't looked at that yet. Uh, they had five tackle for a loss, which okay, I guess. Um, no interceptions, no forced fumbles. Like they, you, you can't win a game. It's hard to win a game in the NFL when you don't cause turnovers. Period. And when you give up two. And even the ones that gave up, like the first the interception, not Justin Herbert's fault. I would argue the fumble probably was Justin Herbert's fault. I think he held on to the ball too long. I'm trying to hear a ball. But like when you're Justin Herbert and you're seeing your offensive line do this, like you kind of have to. Lots to fix. Lots to fix, obviously. But I will die on this hill, Jake. Anyone who says, yourself included, three weeks into the season, season's over, you're not paying attention to the NFL and how the NFL works and how many teams have to go through what you're going through. Look at the two, the two Super Bowl teams are a prime example. How many injuries those two teams, Bengals, Rams, those two teams had to go through 
Bengals, less so injury, more so they had zero offensive line. Yes, they had God mode and Jamar Chase, but zero offensive line, got to the freaking Super Bowl. Chargers waxed them on the road. Rams were hurt all season. Still found a way to win. Like, shout out to Ryan Dyrud, LAFB. Um, he and I were talking about this exact thing. Like, you you need perspective. Like, you still got you still got the dude. You still got Justin Herbert. Corey Lindsley's coming back. You got Keenan Allen, Mike Williams. You got Austin Eckler. Like, you, you have the tools to make this right. If you're going to sit here and tell me that this season's over, like, there is no more discussion. Like, <laughs> like they're, like, it's bad. Like, you guys got to be better than that. I appreciate I know, I know that's the emotional side of people. I get it. I know it sucks. But, like, take a breath. You're one game back in the AFC West. The Broncos don't look great, at least offensively. The Raiders haven't won a game. The Chiefs are one game ahead of you. And you look pretty damn good against them. That's facts. That's where, that's where you're at. Yes, you're down your left tackle. I get it. You got a god in Justin Herbert. Like, you got you Thor back there. Like, he, you've seen him carry the team. He can do it again. Thank you for your lesson on perspective. You're very welcome. Let me just give you a little update on reality. Uh, it's just like the, it's the most metaphorical Chargers thing ever. I was just mentioning who do you go out and possibly get as a replacement to come in on the offensive line, and I dropped Mike Remmer's name. <laughs> sure enough, five minutes later, Tom Pelissero just tweets, Mike Remmer's is signing with the New York Jets practice squad and is eventually going to be elevated to the 53-man roster for them. So there's that. So there's one less option for you to bring in for your offensive line. Dan, I will say this, and this you might actually appreciate. Whether you want to call this perspective, reality, whatever it is, the people that are simply coming out with the arguments to fire Telesco, fire Staley, fire Lombardi, this, that, and the other. Look, they're not gonna, it's not gonna be a fire sale. Okay. So just get that notion out of your head. It's a very easy argument to just come out and say something like that because you're upset. Trust me, I'm a hundred times more upset than the man to my <laughs> to my right as it relates to the screen. I'm a hundred times more upset than he is. I'm much I'm more not happy. Of, I'm not I'm happy. much more of the doubter than he is. And he's he's not even. He's not even happy. Exactly. And I'm about 50 feet below where he is right now. <laughs> but look, everybody just saying that it's the, the key to this whole figuring it out is simply go out and fire the coach. Well, look, tell me the last time that the Chargers fired a head coach midseason. It hasn't ended up happening in any time in recent memory. And then if you go back to, and I, and I feel like I have said this damn argument over and over and over again, you have fired coaches before. How has that solved your problem to where we are at today? And it hasn't. And it hasn't. So I don't want to hear that anymore because it's, it's really not going to solve the immediate future problem. The reality is the Chargers are in a very bad position. And unless something is drastically changed, and I'm not talking from a coaching perspective. Wait, 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 wait. The reality is that they're in a very bad position. What do yes. you mean? I'm talking about from an injury standpoint. Okay. Thank you for letting me clarify myself on that, Dan. They're in a very bad position from an injury perspective. You're, you're thankfully, you're one and one in the division. Yes, you have a long way to go. But unless something is corrected from not a coaching personnel, I'm talking from coaching schematically Okay. to tailor this around the injuries, as Dan Agreed. was alluding to. Agreed. I don't see this ending well, Dan. Because I, I, I would agree. I would agree. Because I don't have confidence that that will happen. As you said, is it possible? Sure. Anything is possible. But... Given the Chargers' history, <laughs> and if you want to say that this team is cursed, whatever it is that you want to say, 
look, I feel you. I fully believe in the CBS Fox NFL announcer curse that That's befalls weird. a bunch of teams. I fully believe that. <laughs> and there hasn't been much to smile about with this franchise from a regular season record or playoff performance standpoint in a number of different years. And unfortunately, the cursed aspect of injuries is one of the biggest reasons that has kept them out of it. But injuries are a part of the game at the end of the day. And the good teams, especially from a coaching standpoint, are able to adapt and create a working game plan that can be sustainable and work to win games. Time will tell if this coaching staff is going to do it. But buckle up, because on paper it's a long season, but this may be a long season if you are a fan of the Los Angeles Chargers. If you were if you were a song to uh, play as like the backdrop for Chargers fandom right now, what song would you be? I'd be like a like a bellicose, like just bass organ. Not like the not the not the what is it the smallest violin playing the just the violin. Kind of thing. Yeah, no, no, nothing like that. I'd be like some low bellicose, you know. <laughs> Bass just slowly just ringing it down like Inception music, yeah, something like that. Okay, mm. noted. Maybe um, like Nightmare on Elm Street because that's what this feels like right now. <laughs> so I guess uh, agenda for me tonight is <laughs> Inception, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Liquid Death. That sounds like a fun night for. Actually, that sounds like a really good night <laughs> for you. Hey, your October. Christmas time is coming up here real quick, which is crazy. It's already almost October. All right, Jake. Uh, I hope this is therapeutic for folks who are listening, <laughs> watching. I know it's not easy to go through this stuff, especially after a loss. Um, but do yourself a favor and like take a couple beats, go on a run, go play some sport. Uh, it was a shitty day, but let's put it in perspective. The Chargers are still very much in it. They're, a, they're one game behind. A lot of questions. I'll give you that. A lot of questions. But let's watch this thing play out a little bit before you all jump ship. Yourself Dan, included, Jake. I know Dan, draft is exciting. Hang on. To end this, I want to hear, because <laughs> you're the one that created this 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 plan essentially to come up on how to possibly save the chargers offense. Now I want to hear your confidence level in the coaching staff to actually put it together. And if it's above 20%, Dan, you and I need to have a talk off air. <laughs> I plead the fifth. Oh my God. <laughs> For Jake Hefner, you can find him in his backwards hat and his non-working microphone 85% of the time at Jake T Hefner. You can find myself and my plead the faith 20% optimism at Dan W sports. Uh, I might give you an answer to that later, Jake. I'm still thinking about it. 20% is a good line. If this is, if we were sponsored by BUSR still, well, if, how do you use that as the line? Um, guys, thank you so much. Hopefully next week bodes better for us and for this Chargers team. We'll talk to you next time. <laughs> Chargers only just the most. <laughs> morbid depressing way to end this damn episode <laughs> goodbye you guys <laughs> <laughs>